At Brand Secrets and Strategies, you learn how to save valuable time and money, where you learn strategies to get your products on more store shelves and into the hands of more shoppers, empowering brands and raising the bar. Do you want to know the best way to get your message out in front of your community? The best way to build trust and a relationship with your community? If you do, then stay tuned. Video is one of the fastest growing mediums when it comes to talking to your community, having that personal one-on-one -on -one relationship with your community. This is where you get people to know, like, and trust your brand. What's great about video, as you're going to hear about in this episode, it allows you to communicate well beyond the written word. The cool thing about video is it's something that everyone gravitates to, and if you can do it and do it well, this is going to help you expand your influence within your community and better communicate your message. That's the focus of this podcast episode, to help you build your story out and to help you get your brand on more store shelves and in the hands of more shoppers. It's all about how you build community around your brand. And as you go back and listen to previous episodes, this is what I talk about. It's the shopper that buys your product. It's far more valuable to the retailer than the ingredients inside your packaging. No, I don't want to make light of your package or your product. What I'm getting at is that it's that customer that that retailer wants to acquire, wants to have them come back into the store. Again, this is what this episode's about, so you definitely want to stay tuned. As always, I want to thank you for listening. This show is about you and it's for you. In appreciation for your time, there's a free downloadable guide for you at the end of every episode. I always include one easy-to-download, quick-to-digest strategy that you can instantly adopt and make your own, one that you can use to grow sustainable sales and compete more effectively with. Don't forget to go back and listen to previous episodes where I may solve some of your most pressing bottlenecks. You know the things that keep you up late at night? If you like the podcast, share with a friend, subscribe, and leave a review. I appreciate you for listening. Remember, the goal here is to get your products on more store shelves and into the hands of more shoppers. Now here's Jeff. Jeff, right. thank you for coming on today. Could you start by telling us a little bit about yourself and how you got to where you're at? And what I'm really interested in is your journey in terms of how you learned to become a videographer and how, how you learned how to tell people's story with video. Sure. Um, uh, I'm Jeff Fuerberg. I'm the creative uh, director and managing partner of Sword Digital. Um, and I I kind of grew up doing this. My my parents were both in the news. My mom was a producer in radio and television, and my father was a reporter, and my godparents were a producer and a videographer. Um, uh, and and so as, as long as I can remember, I've kind of been living and breathing you know, some form of, of visual storytelling. And I I went to school really thinking I would be a writer and, and getting very into English and novels and uh, decided, you know, probably about halfway through my junior year that it didn't really make sense because I could never really ensure that, you know, the story I was telling was a story that was getting across a page that that kind of breakdown in language and that ability for people to imagine things differently is something that always caught me off guard. And that's when I, you know, kind of went back into looking at, at film and, and photography. And so I, uh, I went to film school. I started at Emerson College uh, out in Boston, Massachusetts, and I finished uh, here uh, in Colorado at, at CU Boulder um, with film degrees. And during, during my time in college, I worked uh, as a photographer's assistant for, you know, one of my jobs. And I ended up assisting for a couple of different photographers on really, really large scale studio shoots and location shoots for, for outdoor uh, lifestyle brands. And I really love that as well. And so when I graduated school and I started looking for a job, um, it was 2012. Uh, the job market was a little bit funky. Uh, and I, I started making my way through a lot of other jobs that had nothing really to do with what I do now. I worked for Apple. I worked for Remax, uh, and then I, I found my way kind of slowly by working at Remax back into uh, visual storytelling. I joined their uh, internal education kind of program where they produce a lot of video, and they produce a lot of motion graphics, and they do a lot of photography. And I ended up, you know, doing that job for a couple of years, and it was it was while doing that job that I decided uh, with a couple of my friends from college to start sort of digital. Um, they came aboard as, as kind of smaller partners in a, in a support role, especially at first when there wasn't a lot of work. And um, my kind of biggest, 
idea behind Sora was that we can make really, really, really beautiful work and we can meet companies where they need to be both budgetarily and um, aesthetically pretty well if we continue to run lean, if we continue to just have that open dialogue. And, and that's what really drew us to starting this company is not necessarily working for the biggest names in the world, but working for every name in the world, being available to everyone, whether it's a small natural food company or a nonprofit here in town or some of those larger names. We do work with bigger companies. We do work with publicly traded and, and Fortune 500 companies, and we don't change our rates. We, we charge what we charge, and we work with people on, on what they need. And so... Uh, we're able to kind of work across different industries and different spectrums. And that's what keeps me really, really invested and really, really happy is not pigeonholed into one industry. We don't just work in natural food. We don't just work in restaurants. Uh, we work all over the place because telling stories is our skill set. And we can do that for any story. We may need a little bit of an extra primer uh, if you're, you know, a... Uh, technology securities company. I don't know too much about that industry, so I'll ask for an hour of your time to get me all the way up to speed. But it, it's telling stories. It's finding the value pieces. It's finding what makes your story unique and 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 that value proposition to your consumer. And then it's telling it in a visually uh, interesting way that doesn't also distract from the the kind of main point, which is you. Cool. Thanks for going through all that. Let me back up a little bit. So. Can you talk about your experience in terms of what did you learn at school as a film student that helped you with today? And not mm. just in terms of the lighting and stuff like that, although that's very important, but how did that help you with your storytelling? Or did you learn that later through your experiences? I think, I think film school taught me a lot of really important things that I haven't learned anywhere else. And and some of that is certainly the, the technical aspect of, of what, what I do and what we do. But in reality, you can learn that through experience, through practice, through training, through YouTube, through tutorials, through assisting. What film school really taught me in, in a way that nothing else really has is the ability to prepare under pressure um, and the ability to kind of understand uh, the engineering term that I've always gravitated towards is tolerance. So tolerance is like the, the amount of, of wiggle room, so to speak, or the amount of air room you have when you're building something because of the way pieces can fit together. And tolerance has changed depending on what you're building with and, and what you're joining pieces with and how structurally stable that specific piece of the structure has to be. And all of that really actually also is very important when it comes to media because there's tolerance in film and there's tolerance in editing, both in photography and video. And, and there's even tolerance in websites. There's tolerance everywhere. And so what film school really taught me to do was prepare a plan very quickly and collaboratively with whoever I'm working with. And, and also in building that preparation, find the tolerances where we have some wiggle room, either time wiggle room or money wiggle room or or space wiggle room. You'll, you know, you'll prepare this entire shot list and storyboard around a, a film and get to the location and none of it works anymore. There's something that you didn't account for. There's a huge pillar that's blocking the master shot that you wanted. How do you, how do you find your way around that? What's the tolerance there? Well, we need a master shot. So, you know, what, what film school kind of taught me is how to prepare and use that preparation when things go wrong. Don't just throw out the plan, but, but make it more. And I think, and we've, you know, we've talked about this. You came to a talk where this was kind of my main point. Preparation is what allows us to make good work. And and open communication and dialogue and collaboration is is necessary for that initial pre-production planning. And that doesn't matter if it's a, a logo I'm designing for you or a website we're building for you or if we're going into production on a video. It's It's those initial concept drawing meetings that are really important to making sure we're all on the same page. We all have our deliverables scheduled, but we also know where the tolerances are. We know what we're willing to maybe give out or give away or give up on in order to get what we need. Uh, and that, that is a lesson that I've, I, I haven't learned anywhere else. I'm sure you can, but that's really what I think film school gave um, all, all three of our, our founding members. On that note, 
I met you at NatchConf, so thank you for sharing that. And and the reason mm-hmm. I wanted to have you on the podcast today is because of exactly this. Film is a big, scary thing because it's new and different to a lot of people, video. But yet it's not that scary or horrible, you know, a, a difficult of a thing to adopt once you start doing it and get used to it. So thank you for mm-hmm. sharing that. And one of the things I loved most about what you talked about, Jeff, is that you frame this in a way where you made it easier to understand what matters first. And it's all about, like you said, the preparation. Where a lot of times when I'm getting, I'm just starting to get into, you started a YouTube channel and, you know, trying to get the lighting right and trying to get all that stuff done and spend so much time with the mechanics that kind of overtakes the the strategy, the plan, what I'm going to talk about, et cetera. Right. It's kind of interesting. Um, I can get up front of a group of a couple thousand people not a problem. I can talk to them, feel very comfortable by myself with that little camera staring back at me. Just, it's so, it, it's weird. It freaks you out. So with that in mind, um, what do you, when you talk about preparation, what do you mean by that? What suggestions would you give to someone who wants to go down this path? And And where I want to go with this is not only the preparation, but why is film, why is video important? Why is it necessary? Why should you consider it? Sure. Um, I, th- I think the best way to answer those kind of two questions is to do it in reverse of how they were asked. Video is really important right now, I think more than ever, especially in marketing, because it, it has the ability when done right to kind of stop the behavior of, of the medium you're in. So you, you hear all the time, there's this buzz kind of idea out there of stopping the scroll on social media. But it's not just the scroll on social media, it's also the, the pervasiveness of really, really quick web browsing. Um, people are looking to imbibe information as quickly as possible when they're digitally connected, whether it's a website or social media or an email newsletter, it, it doesn't matter. What we're trying to do is glean the information quickly and move on. And that's for any number of reasons. The first is we're bombarded with messaging all day. What video has the potential to do is stop that and make people take a breath and really look at what's happening. And that's typically done with really beautiful visuals and sound, but why that's important now getting to kind of that that kind of first point is it allows you the ability to maybe be a little more complex with your messaging when you take a photo when you're when you're posting something to instagram when you have a an email campaign that you're sending out the the main idea is to distill things down as much as possible to one very simple to understand idea new colorway new flavor sale these are, these are very quick to understand concepts that we're all familiar with, but also it takes away a little bit of the why there. Why is there a new flavor? Why is there a new color? Why is this going on sale? What's going on? What is the company doing? What's the value that it's, that it's pushing to the forefront by releasing this flavor or this color or discounting this product? Are you discounting this product because there's a new one coming? Are you discounting this product because... Uh, it's you know the third anniversary of your company and you're a Kickstarter funded company that made it without any investment and you want to celebrate the people that basically funded you to begin with and give away something. There's more to that story and the more of that story typically resonates better with consumers. I don't want a sale on a backpack. I don't want a sale on books. What I do want is that appreciation. I want you to recognize why you're doing the sale and that'll make me browse. That'll make me maybe take advantage of it more. I don't care about the new flavor unless the new flavor is meant to celebrate the heritage of your company, which is, you know, two people of Mexican descent kind of returning back to that flavor profile that they grew up with. That's super interesting to me, even if it's not a flavor I'd normally go for. So what video allows you to do is make people kind of understand that a little bit more or or at least watch it a little bit more. It gives you the opportunity to make that complexity happen, even in those mixed formats, like an email newsletter, a a GIF or a cinemagraph, some sort of motion as the header of that email will allow people to kind of stop, see what's going on, take that three or four seconds to reset their brain and then decide, oh, this is kind of cool. Maybe I will read that that quick blip paragraph that that says what's going on. Maybe I maybe I will 
click through the link in the bio on Instagram to learn more about that new colorway, or or maybe I will look at that sale and see what what it is that you're you're kind of giving back to me. And so, if you're if you're looking to start with video, if you're looking to kind of get started, that's the most important part. The most important part is not the lighting, it's not the camera. You're going to figure that out, or you're going to hire someone who does it in their sleep. That's really not the hard part. The hard part is writing and building a story that tells that kind of value proposition or tells that narrative and puts it together in a way that will make people stop. But it always starts with why. Why are we doing this? What are we doing? And what is the point? And if you start there, then the rest of prep kind of builds. I love how you frame things. The visualization as you talk. That's why I was so impressed with what you shared at Natchcom because a lot of people don't do that. They don't take the time to really explain why this matters. It's you need to put a video on YouTube. That's it, in a sense. But yet, what are you trying to do? So, okay, now let me ask you about storytelling. I love the fact that you're talking about your video story, visual storytelling. What I'm trying to do, Jeff, is I'm trying to get brands to tell their story in such a way where it it helps the retailer understand the value, the unique customer that they drive into a store. So let me back up a little bit. Retail's pay to play. It's very expensive. And the current strategy today is that a brand needs to get their checkbook out and just write checks saying, you know, this is how much it gets cost to get on the shelf. This is how much it costs to promote right. it, etc. Reality is that the value of the customer that that brand drives into a retail store is far more important to the retailer than any of the slotting or any of the fees that they charge. So mm -hmm. I'm trying to get brands to tell their story more effectively, especially natural organic brands. And so with that in mind, how would you relate that to what you're talking about, visual medium? And the reason this matters is because I'm trying to get brands to adopt strategies like you're talking about and even go into this realm of visual storytelling. Sure. I, th I think there are, there are really a couple of, of reasons to really in, in, kind of get into this side of storytelling when it comes to uh, I'll put retailers and even investors and venture capitalists in the kind of same boat. When I was a uh, creative director for a natural food brand, you know, the, the basic idea was for either of those, you have kind of a pitch deck. You have that really beautiful and slickly produced PowerPoint for lack of a better term, that is then sent off as a PDF or printed out for the for the meeting or, or for the handoff at, at Expo or Natchcom or wherever you are where you might be meeting that buyer or that investor. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. There really isn't. You can tell a story really beautifully and visually on that piece of paper. But the problem with that piece of paper is I can look at it and I can thumb through twice if we're in a meeting and then I'm expected to look at you and ask you a question. And the answer to that question might be on the third page that I haven't gotten to yet, but it kind of derails that momentum of the narrative. Narratives don't have to be tricky, but are best told when they're really well contained, right? If you think about your favorite TV show or your favorite movie, there isn't a five minute break, 30 minutes in where you ask questions and get answers before it unfolds. The best kind of way that stories are told and the way that we ingest them, especially in 2020 after over a hundred years of visual mediums is we watch them and we kind of trust the idea that everything will kind of be told to us the way it needs to. And we can take advantage of that as brands by creating that little two to three and a half minute brand video that is so powerful, both for Kickstarters and, and that kind of company I mentioned that is all Kickstarter funded. Well, they did that through that video, that video resonated with their product towards people in their demographic and people bought in. The same is true around retailers and products. If you have a very special, very unique product, if you have a very special and unique value proposition that reaches a number of demographics, maybe you're vegan and paleo and gluten-free and delight, delightful and nutritious and versatile in how you're eaten, um, well, tell that to them through this video, but also explain why, because people aren't going to just resonate with you because you're a vegan brand and they're vegan. They're not going to just resonate with you because you're paleo and they're paleo. They need more than that. They want to know why you're vegan. Um, 
I've worked with a number of companies that are that have vegan products and non-vegan founders who have been very, very scared to put that information out there. I don't want them to know I'm not I'm not also a vegan. There's a reason for that fear. I think it's unfounded because I think it's completely acceptable to say, hey, I'm not vegan, but this snack is, and I think it's important that everybody can enjoy it. But that's a lot harder to do if you say, well, I'm not vegan, and the next thing out of anyone's mouth is, well, then why did you make a vegan snack? If you have a video, they're not going to do that. They're not going to pause it. They're going to let the video play. And so in, in retail spaces, in investor spaces, anywhere where your narrative is really the forefront or the important selling point, video is a great way to tell it. If for nothing else, then it just doesn't get interrupted. You can say, here's our video. You can put it in the email with that PDF deck that has your numbers. But say, hey, watch this video and then let us know what questions you have. Watch this video. Here are our numbers. We'd love to talk to you about placement, right? I think that opens up the conversation a little bit more to the, the broader points of what you'd look to discuss with a retailer because the, the rest of it's kind of taken care of. They already understand the image. They already understand the value proposition. And hopefully they, there's an aesthetic of your video that complements your branding. Hopefully it's done in a way that it all feels like one cohesive structure. And that tells them your control over your marketing is good. And that's something that retailers do want because while it is pay to play, retailers are looking for brands to push people to store. Retailers want that really, really important brand that people are going to look for. And then they want you to talk about how you are Whole Foods exclusive on your next flavor that you're putting out. And here's why you're putting out that flavor. And here's why you're doing it with Whole Foods. And if you can control your narrative, that gives you a little bit of extra leverage when you're in that room talking to them, because maybe you can control it for both of you. Love the way you frame that. And this is exactly what I teach brands. So to kind of back up a little bit, mm -hmm. instead of just showing up and saying, hey, I'm a nice guy, got a cool t-shirt, great slogan, you're going to love me, please put me on the shelf, hoping right. and praying that they don't put you in the back room. I mm -hmm. encourage brands to help the retailer merchandise their product where the customers can find it, where it makes sense. And I'll give you an example. Sure. A lot of times, a lot of the brands that I work with, Jeff, they go to the retailer and the retailer puts it on the wrong shelf. In fact, actually, in podcast episode 104, true story, a lady called me uh, about a week before she was listening to the podcast and was asking questions. She went into a retailer to support a friend who just got a product um, on the shelf. The company spent a lot of money to promote it. The retailer was excited because they're going to get all the new traffic. The problem is the agency that, and this wasn't the agency's fault, it's just that no one helped the retailer understand where it needed to be. But the problem yep. was the product was put in the wrong place. So after 20 minutes of looking for the product in the store with the help of the store personnel, they found the product. Now this was a huge failing in terms of a promotion because the brand spent a lot of money, a lot of customers disappointed because they couldn't find the product. The retailer lost out because they didn't get the new traffic or the buzz or the excitement, et cetera. And now the brand needs to spend a lot of money to get that product re-merchandised where it should have been originally. And it's problems like this, yeah. Jeff, that excuse me, that that bankrupt and derail brands. And this is what I'm trying to help brands understand. So back to your point, in terms of controlling that narrative. It's so critically important, and I'm so glad you shared that. You know, where does your product go on the shelf? Why does your product matter? What's unique about the customer that you drive in the store? When they're in your store, what are the other items that they buy? And these are all part of the conversation I'm trying to get brands to have. Exactly why I wanted to have you on. Another thing is Pitch Deck. I am on the Selection Committee Advisory Board. I don't know exactly what you'd call it for Nutrition Capital Network and some other groups, etc., where I will go through and read pitch decks that people submit. And then those brands later go on. Sometimes I'll mentor them, et cetera. But to your point, a lot of brands say, I'm going to go from $3 to $5 million within the first year. They don't tell you how they're going to get there, et cetera. Some brands take the time to put together a short video. And I love it because, like you said, now that I'm thinking about it, it controls the narrative. It helps me understand why did they go down this path, what problem are they solving, and it helps me understand how their solution fits into the bigger world, into the retail environment. Thank you for sharing that. What other thoughts do you have along that, or perhaps some comments you want to make about what I just said? Yeah, I, I do want to touch on, on that story about merchandising, because I think the other thing that you can get out of 
really, really good pre-production is the ability to make a lot of videos at once. The, the ability to make a lot of different smaller pieces of video that are really, really valuable, maybe even internally. So I know of a, I didn't do this video, but I, I, I have a friend who was working with a company who had a very similar issue with merchandising on shelf. And they had pulled some strings and were able to get into a Whole Foods uh, to film a little bit of their own little two minute pitch deck video. But they had been talking with their creative partnership um, you know, video creator and they'd been working together for long enough that they had shared with her, hey, we're not, you know, we may have to go in and re-merchandise the shelf because they don't know where to put us. And through that kind of collaboration, through that, a light bulb went off when they were in Whole Foods, quickly doing that commercial shoot. They went in around 6 a.m. when everybody was kind of resetting for the day. They took about 45 minutes and they filmed a where to merchandise us video. Good. Quick little script, nothing crazy. And that was all part of that bigger project. And so the other thing that you can get by being really, really collaborative by sharing with your creative partnership, you know, what you need it is they were able to get a second, really just internal video, but it went out to the agency, their merchandisers, which was a nationwide company. And they could just watch that video on their phone. Hey, I'm here. I need to brand you. I forget kind of where we're going. I'm repping, you know, 50 brands at the moment and you're new. Oh, here's 30 seconds on exactly where I should be and exactly how I should be what order the flavor should be in on the shelf if there are more than two, where we should be, you know, it, it's, it's not enough anymore to say we want to be eye level and we want to be, you know, exactly where the consumer is going to shop for this secondary product. That's not how it works. But a little video, again, I think it was like 30 seconds and it was like a quick walkthrough. Hey, I'm the founder of X. Typically, we like to be merchandised here. Let's go. Cut to that shelf. See, this is what it should look like. This is the first flavor we want. If there are more than two, we like it faced. We'd love eye level if we can get it. We'd prefer to be higher than lower. Cut to black logo. That was it, right? But Perfect. that's way more powerful than the email that they have to go and find and read and then recheck and then true up with, you know, what you said the aisle should be, but it's not actually the aisle. And the video, you can literally see all the other products around it. So even if the aisle is called something different because you're in a different chain, you know what it goes next to. You have five or six reference markers that you didn't have to put in there. You just shot the video exactly where you wanted it. That's really powerful because it saves you time, right? As a brand, you have a video. You can send it to anyone. If that agency and you don't work out and you end up hiring some freelance merchandisers on the Eastern Seaboard and your California brand, send them the video. The video is done. You already have it. You have it forever. And they were able to do that and film it because of that pre-production and planning. So the other kind of thing to think about when you're doing video, when you're getting into video, is how can I get the most out of this time? How can I get the most out of this shoot? What else might I need at that, that location that's hard to get? Video is expensive. Video creators are expensive. So are photographers. So are graphic designers. What's a little bit different about video than packaging design is you can – manage to find the tolerance in in that shoot day in that timing to maybe get a little more out of it whereas your packaging design should really just be focused on getting your packaging done and done right and your photographer is probably going to not necessarily have the time to go somewhere else and shoot something else in that day maybe they will we do it a lot but a lot of it has to do with that collaboration at the forefront hey we have 30 shots that we need you to get and then if there's time because we hired you for a day We'd love to get you over there to shoot one last thing. Do you think that can happen? We'd love to get two shots outdoors with the city behind us. Can we do that? Well, yes, no, right? Here's, yeah, I think we can do that. It's a low shot list. We could be done by sunset. I know exactly where I can go. Let me squeeze that in too, right? It's all about com communication and that pre-planning. No, that's perfect. Actually, I've got a mini course that is all about this, although I didn't talk about video, I love the idea of exploring this. The It's about how to get your product on a shelf, uh, how to land shelf space. And the point being is that if you walk in with a visual, here's where it goes on the shelf. Here's how it needs to be merchandised. Here are the other products around. Same thing that you were talking about. I love the video solution better. But if this is a, a really low cost, easy thing that every brand should do. And the funny thing about it is, sad funny thing, is that these are the Achilles heels of the big brands. They don't do that. 
And so if the little brands can do that, it's going to make such an impact on their overall sales. So I've got a series of courses and whatnot that I put together that are designed to help brands capitalize on these strategies. I've also got a free course, a turnkey sales story strategies course, which is all about teaching brands how to tell their story and how to bake that into their brand's DNA. And that's the foundational stuff. And to your point, if you've got that foundation so that if I were to call you and say, hey, Jeff, I need help with a video project, at least now I've got the framework, who my customer is, what's important, what they look for, etc. Kind of what you touched on before, a lot of brands that I've worked with find out that their core customer, their ideal customer from their perspective, is not really who's buying their product. There was a a company that was an oatmeal company that was dead set on this is what we do. And they found out that moms were using it as a baby food. They had no idea that they fit into that space. And so yeah. part of this is understanding who your core customer is and how they shop, etc. So thank you for sharing all that. So when you're talking about the collaboration, the pre-planning, and this is so critically important, a lot of brands effectively hand the keys to someone else and say, go run my ship. Huge mistake. One. And two, again, they don't know enough about the retailer or the customer or about the market or whatever to really help guide their broker, their distributor, their agencies to succeed on their behalf. So they fail as a result. I love the fact that you said you're suggesting putting together a short video that you could pass on to your merchandisers. Incredible idea. So what else would you recommend that a brand do to help prepare to even be able to go down that path? In other words, which kind of things should they be thinking about when they want to leverage the strategy you just shared? I think what's important to think about, and, and this is something that I kind of talk about a lot when I'm, when I'm asked, you know, how do we do video and how do we do it you know, affordably? How do we do it, you know? How do we do this the cheap route? How do we do this, you know, as easy as possible? A lot of that has to do with what you're willing to give up. Uh, I think I shared this at the at the talk at Natchcom, but you know, in general, there are a lot of really good video creators out there who are self-taught and do their own thing and and will do it for um, maybe a little bit less money, but they likely will do it for less money and not be able to change their aesthetic. And so what you likely give up when doing, you know, user generated content or, or smaller content is you save money and you lose some of that branding. And, uh, you know, I, I, I kind of shared this in the talk in, in, in more of a cheeky way where I said, if you don't care about your brand's ex aesthetic and the, and the user experience of experiencing your brand, then that's fine. And I looked around the room as everybody went, well, I, I do because I've spent money on my logo and my website and my packaging. And it's, it's very important uh, especially in you know competitive industries like natural food that 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 aesthetic is kind of held to and kept and the fact of the matter is because of that what you're looking for is a partnership you should be asking for more than just a reel you sh you know in in general when when we onboard a new client especially for video work when video work is the first thing we're doing we have three Three, two to four phone calls probably before an invoice or a, a full kind of scope of work is sussed out. Those phone calls can be over two days. Um, those phone calls can be over four weeks, depending on the timeline. But it takes a long time to bring someone in, teach them your brand and what's important, answer their questions about the holes that they may see in the information they've been given so that you get this kind of complete picture. And so the first question that I often get asked by somebody approaching me for video work is, do you have, you know, do you have the bandwidth for this? Do you have the time? And the first thing I say is, you know, I know that I have the bandwidth to do this. Do you? This isn't something where you can actually hand those keys over and get something really great. You're going to need to collaborate. And that doesn't mean you need to be there every step of the way, right? We can have those phone calls. We can have that kind of kickoff meeting where we brainstorm the script and then I need you to read the script. I'm going to write it. You're paying me to do that. I'm going to put together a storyboard. That's on me. But I do need you to set out about half an hour to read and digest it and give feedback. Or that's the script we're going with. I'm going to think it's good. I'm not turning in something that isn't. But maybe I've missed something. I've had 
at most five phone calls about this brand. Maybe I'm a fan of this brand already and understand my experience of it, but that doesn't mean that I understand the full demographic weight. That doesn't mean I understand the full target of the goal we're going for. So make sure you have that half hour. Make sure you can put somebody from the brand on set with me if possible. Have them review footage with me. That's not ever a problem, right? We're used to that. We have playback on every piece of equipment in video for the last 40 years for that reason. You should have somebody who knows the brand a little bit better than me with me. Do you have that person? Is it you? Is it somebody in marketing? Is it is it your wife? It, a lot of times it is. It's, it's the spouse. It's the partner of the founder who knows the brand because they've watched it grow but may not actually have a, a job at the company. That's fine. That's not a problem. What you're looking for is just someone to make sure the voice is right all the way through. And whether I nail it without any of that overhead or not, you should have the bandwidth as a company to do that. Do you have time in the edit process to watch a couple of the cuts? Again, I'm going to edit. That's all done by the video creator. You don't have to sit next to me while I do it. It's preferable that you don't. But when I have something for you to look at, are you watching it? Do you have half an hour again to sit, watch, think, give feedback? If not, all the way through, you've just given me the keys to your brand. Maybe I nail it. Maybe I don't. More often than not, the more feedback and collaboration, the better the end product, both on our end and on yours. We want to do it right. I don't know any, anybody who puts the amount of time into video and, and photo and web that doesn't want everyone to be really happy with the result at the end of it. We want that feedback and that collaboration. So that's the first thing I would do. Hey, video sounds cool. I would love, you know, this guy really seems to understand what he's talking about. I want a brand video. Cool. I want to make you one. Do you have time? It's far less time than I need for this project, but I need you to have that time. I need you to be ready to do it. I think it's so critical. Otherwise, you're not going to like it. Thank you for sharing that. It's so very important. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. It's so very mm -hmm. important that you shared that because to your point, a lot of people just hand stuff off. You know, again, they hand the keys to their broker, their distributor, somebody else. Here, it's your problem now. And a lot of people think, unfortunately, small brands think that as soon as the product leaves their warehouse, the selling is done. No, no, it's just getting started. So I love yeah. the fact that you're talking about the collaboration that's required to do it. This is your brand. If this brand matters to you, well, you got to see it through. You got to make sure mm -hmm. that it looks right on the shelf. I, I talk about this a lot. If you go into a store and there's no product on the shelf, it's not the broker's fault. It's not the retailer's fault. In fact, I was talking to a brand a couple of weeks ago where I found an out of stock and they sent me a note saying, don't worry about it. We've got this, you know, we're, we're putting it in a different place. It's like, wait a minute, you're missing sales. You're embarrassing the retailer. You're losing an opportunity to get your product in front of a customer. You're not putting your best foot forward in front of that customer and that retailer. Hey, it's your choice. But to me, that's a huge and mistake. And don't worry about it. Yeah. Yeah. It's problematic. I was surprised to hear that, especially from this particular brand. But anyhow, so thank you for sharing it because that is so critically important. So when you're thinking about putting together everything, um, I love the fact you're talking about your partnership and you're working with brands. One of the things you said earlier, Jeff, is that you've worked with a lot of different industries or in a lot of different industries. How does that help you help the brand understand what they need. And what I'm getting at, you kind of touched on it a little bit. I may not see everything that's relevant to how customers use my brand or what's relevant to how retailers merchandise it. How does that experience help you? And how would you recommend someone leverage that? Because again, I don't know what I don't know. So how do you help guide sure. me to make the best decisions to help you on my behalf? Got it. I think... I think that's a really interesting question, and it doesn't have a, a clean set answer. I think there are two distinct advantages from my perspective of working across a bunch of industries, and that is I see how the same demographic or very similar demographics get tapped and kind of visually stimulated across the board. And that's a really important one, especially when you talk about natural food, because in general, Natural foods are, are going after younger clients. They're going after uh, you know, millennials 
with a little bit of cash who are very interested in their health that are part of a food tribe. And that food tribe is going to be kind of reached the same within natural food more often than not. Hey, this is our product. It's very clean. This is what it's missing. This is what it has. This is the reason to have it in these situations. It's a great after gym snack. It's perfect on a salad. It's great for Whole30, like that. What other industries will do is find that exact same target. Women 25 to 35 with a little bit of money who are health conscious, and they will show them a very different ad. Peloton is a great example of this. They are just targeting that group right now, really men and women. But their ads look so drastically different visually than anything that any of the natural food brands are kind of doing right now. Well, by working in other industries, not only am I able to analyze that, which any you know kind of good video creator can do is say, well, Peloton also wants millennials. Look at that ad. But I also know how they're performing. Right? I'm behind the scenes on a lot of those videos, not Peloton, but a lot of those videos that are hitting that same demographic are playing with different tools and different techniques and know what's working and what's not. Well, I can take that and I can kind of copy and paste that over and say, well, you know, what's really not working with you know, men 25 to 35 is time lapses. Uh, they don't seem to react the way that we, we thought they would to that, but they are really reacting to stop motion animation over in this segment. You know, this brand, this brand, and this brand just all did those videos. And the reason is because this video is like wildfire and, and it sales went crazy. So everybody's kind of moving towards stop motion. Well, that hasn't touched natural food yet. Let's be the first. That hasn't touched headphones yet. Let's be the first. It's not just natural food. It's working across industries allows you to see this kind of entire field of what is happening in video and what is working really well. And that's typically how things change and, and move between industry. So I think that's really, really important. Um, I think the other thing that's really important is, you know, I, I say all the time, hey, know exactly what you're looking for when you approach us. Have a why to the video. Have an idea of what you're looking for. But also part of that collaboration is say, hey, here's what we want. Here's our, you know, maybe here's our timeline. Here's our budget. Here are our big three things that we need to hit. Can you do it? Well, yes, I think we can do that. Perfect. Take a day and think about any other cool ideas that might fit into this kind of campaign we're putting together that you think we could also do roughly in that budget and that time frame. Give, give us the opportunity to then say, hey, these two campaigns are great. There's a third mini campaign we could probably fit in because we're already going to need to film in a grocery store and in a studio. You haven't you know, looked at maybe these other 10 small gifts we can create to fill out this whole campaign on social. And we can do it for another hundred dollars, you know, because it's going to take a little bit of extra post post production on the back end. Give us that time to react. Give us the time to kind of see what you're presenting and give back because that's how you get that kind of experience. And a lot of times brands, even brands that really know what they want, don't necessarily kind of leave that time. That time's a day. That time's two days. It's that same idea of like, hey, maybe we don't have the time to do that. Maybe you need that, you know, perspective retailer pitch in like a month and we just don't have time. That's okay. Recognize that the tolerance that you've given up here is the ability to be a little more creative. The 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 room to be creative on our end isn't there. So we're gonna do exactly what you need. We're gonna do it well. We're gonna give you something. We're gonna collaborate very nicely together. But you may not get everything you could have out of that sheet, out of that edit session, because we just didn't have the time to think. What more is there? What else can we flesh out? Um, and so that's kind of that that other thing that I've I've learned, especially across industries. Um, other industries are a lot slower in these projects. Uh, projects take a year, two years. Um, Natural food, more than most other industries, are very, very quick. Hey, we've been thinking about video for a while. We heard you were good. We got a referral from this person. We need a video in three weeks. Okay, we can do that. We can totally do that. It's not going to necessarily be the same experience as, hey, we need a video done this year. It's February. We think we want to shoot in April, May. Does that give us time to write a script and make sure it's right? And we'd like it by August. And that gives us enough time to make sure the edit is exactly what we want and perfect and not rushed. Right? Yes, that's right. So, you know, that's kind of the other thing that other industries have shown me is you the the ability to slow down as a brand and see a long-term goal and you probably get this too when it comes to merchandising and and that retailer story is 
that is what is oftentimes so difficult for brands in this space to do is take that breath and go, what do I need in 10 months? It's January. What is my holiday strategy? Do I have one? Oh, that's a cool one. It's January. I have time to do it. What infuriated me more than anything else was November one rolling around and someone going, I have a, I've had a kind of a cool idea around what we could do for holiday sales for a couple months now. Do you have a second to talk about it? It's like, yes, but I also had that second eight months ago when I could have done it. So like, I want to hear it, but this is for next year. We're already past it. We can't do it right now. Um, so that's kind of the big thing that, that I would pass on. Thank you for sharing that. Well, this one of the things I talk about a lot, exactly what you said. Smaller brands, especially smaller brands, do not think ahead of what they want to do. And so another thing I focus on, I got a free course on that too, but it's about uh, setting up your, your business plan. The point being yeah. is that your business plan needs to be as far out as you can get. You need to make it as, as complete and thorough as possible so that I could run your business on your behalf, in your absence, flawlessly. And it should include a lot of those things, to your point, because you know brands are not re, uh, proactive, they're reactive, especially with smaller brands, with all the distractions and everything hitting you. So critically important. So thank you for sharing that. I would go one step further to say that one of the things that brands need to do is leverage someone with your experience, et cetera, to help guide them through this process because they don't know what they don't know. And so if I'm coming to you and I say, Jeff, I need a video by tomorrow or last week, I don't know what's involved. And so I'm hoping that people will learn a lot from this. I'm sure they will. And thank you for sharing all your insights. One of the things you talked about was in terms of the bandwidth. This is why I wanted to ask this question. If you go to a doctor who's a surgeon, they're going to want to cut. If you go to a doctor that writes a lot of prescriptions, they're going to write a prescription. So if I go to an agency that's going to want to just film or whatever, they're not going to give me that extra time to help guide me to understand that. So thank you for sharing that. What other advice would you have for a brand that's thinking down the road or whenever, hey, I want to do this, I want to explore this. How would you recommend that they start down this path so that when they get in front of you, they're prepared to give you what you need to help them better. I know I'm kind of asking a little bit of the same question, but yeah. but I don't know what I don't know. And I guess, how do I know mm -hmm. what I should know is, is what I'm getting at. I've always been a really big fan of the idea of, of reaching out and asking. Um, I've never said no to a meeting or a coffee or a phone call. And I would hope that other creators and other agencies don't either. It's completely okay to come and say, I, I think video is cool and I don't know what the process even looks like. Can you walk me through what it, what it could look like to do anything, right? You, if you're going to hire me to do video, you should know what kind of video you want. If you're going to come and, and grab a coffee or, or a beer with me and ask me how, how the process of making a video happens, you actually don't need that because it's kind of the same. It doesn't matter. We have a pre-production point, we have a production point, and we have post-production. We have three kind of stages, and it doesn't matter if I'm making a feature documentary or a brand video or a GIF for social media. At some point, I got to figure out what I'm making. At some point, I got to make the, the kind of raw material of it, and at some point, I got to put it together. And your kind of working with me through those stages is going to probably be roughly the same. It's heavier in post-production. And then it gets kind of smaller and smaller as far as time commitment, right? Here's where we need to make sure we're aligned. And maybe, you know, for that gift for social media, it's a very quick thing. Here is a cool gift. I want to make this for your brand. Great. Run with it. Our favorite color is pink. Cool. Can do. I'll see you in a week. You don't necessarily need to be at the production of that because we know exactly what it looks like and exactly how it works. That's okay. But ultimately, you know, the process isn't, dissimilar. And so what I would say is if you are a small brand or a big brand or a venture capitalist or an agency or a, or a PR agency, for instance, uh, reached out to me after that talk at Natchcom and went, we just want to like understand how this happens. Cool. Let's get coffee. Don't hesitate to reach out and say, hi, I don't know that I have work, but I'd love to talk about how this works. And maybe how this works is not video. Maybe how this works is working with an agency. Agencies get this kind of umbrella label 
right? And that's not really how they work. There are big agencies that are juggernauts that, you know, have account managers for, you know, every 10 brands that they sign on and, and they're huge and they're, you know, national forces. And some agencies are more boutique like mine, where there are three of us, you'll never get handed off. You meet me, I'm your project manager forever until we're not working together anymore. It's just you and me. It's, it's personal. It's experiential. It's relational. Agencies aren't the same, just like food companies aren't the same. So if you're curious about how any of that works, reach out. If they don't have the time to sit and talk with you, they're not the agency for you. And that's okay. They may just not have time. They may not want that. They want to play in the big realm where people know exactly how to walk in the door. Find the agency that doesn't. Call around, send emails, get referrals from friends, and and just offer a coffee for that knowledge. It's not a trade secret for me to tell you how the process of making a video with you would work. It's completely shareable, and it should be. That should be open dialogue. And if it's not, you know that they're probably just not the right person to hold your hand through it. Also, completely fine just different priorities. Just like getting a second opinion or trying another one person's product. I, I mean, it's absolutely, absolutely correct. Absolutely. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, and this, again, this is why I wanted to have you on because the way you frame this, one of the things I love about natural is one of the things that makes natural natural is people like each of us that are willing mm -hmm. and other people too to help fill in those gaps. I, the name of my blog is What You Need to Know. Because people don't think about this. You know, like I said, I'm trying to fill in all those other gaps that are left in the other spaces as you are. So thank you for sharing that. So now let's talk about storyboarding. What is it? Why does it matter? And then how does that impact editing? And the reason I wanted to go here, again, I don't know what I don't know. So I don't know what's required, etc. When you're telling a story, and I think back on any TV show or movie I've watched, they don't film it in order. They film like sections together and then chop it up and put it where it needs to go. So yes. how does that work? I I want to start by kind of talking about what storyboarding means. Because I think there's also this understanding and idea that a storyboard always looks kind of like a comic book of the visual output. Right? You hear storyboard and you you probably see those like behind the scenes features of the director in that big room with like a comic book of star Wars on the wall and him pointing and looking pensive. And that is a way to storyboard. And it's probably the most common, but it is by no means the only way that you can get a really nice storyboard, a very good look and feel of what you're looking for, and then go and, and film the way that you're discussing, which is just non sequentially. Typically when you make a video, or you make multiple videos over two days, or you're making, you know, 30 different GIFs, or even shooting, you know, 50 product images, you don't necessarily do it sequentially. You probably do it in setups or stages or set pieces. So if you're gonna shoot every product as a photo on white, you're gonna run through all of those, and then you're gonna go to the next thing. If you have multiple locations of your video, you're gonna film as much as you can in one location and then move to the next one, because it's economical, it's efficient. Storyboarding, in general, is the act of putting to paper or to computer the amount of information needed to go into a location, shoot everything needed in that space time for that scene, and moving forward. There are creators out there that only do the storyboard comic book style. Sometimes... You don't know exactly what you're going to see at your location or you're brand new to your location. This happens a lot in natural food. Hey, I've got a buddy that runs uh, Whole Foods La Jolla. We can get in there at 6 a.m. I can fly you out the night before. You'll get in at 11. We'll, we'll roll in there at 6 and we'll get it done. Okay. You, that's totally fine if we know about it in advance. But I probably can't really do a great job with that comic book strip version because I don't know exactly what I'm walking into. What I do know is what I need out of that location. I need a close-up of a hand grabbing your product off the shelf. I need uh, a long following shot of somebody walking down that aisle. I need a, you know, somebody scanning it across the cashier wrap. I need, you know, a credit card swiping. I need, you know, this list of shots. And then I probably have a, 
hey, at my Whole Foods, it looks like this. At my Trader Joe's, I have this big open section where your product sits in the back of the produce, you know. Maybe what I can also get is this kind of cool wraparound shot where I start following someone and I kind of walk around them. And instead of three shots of somebody walking down the hallway, a quick reverse, and then seeing them pick up your product, maybe I can do it all in one shot. Well, that's in a maybe list. Now I have two shot lists. A, this is what I definitely need, and this is what I might be able to get depending on how much time I have, what the space actually looks like, what the light actually looks like, all of these things that I won't have control over. That's storyboarding. I still know what I need. And visually, I can kind of give you a rough idea of, of what this could look like. And I probably will, would accompany that with a mood board. Here are stills or other videos that have the exact same look as what we're going for. And if I'm working with another video producing partner, if I'm working with a cameraman, the kind of third step here is this is the light kind of value I need. This is the file format I need. You know, that is a storyboard because it's everything I need to walk into that location, get everything I need out of it and move on. It's not a comic book, but it still works. Maybe it's also an overhead shot of, you know, what I think the overhead of the grocery store looks like with little symbols for where I need to film the entire scene from different angles. Because then I know in the edit, I have this shot and this shot, and this shot. And between those three, I can create this very nice piece. I can create that sense of motion of somebody walking down the aisle and grabbing the product and walking away. I have that coverage. That's also storyboarding. However it needs to happen, to me what is important is the idea that the brand and the video creator are comfortable walking into that location. I'll be the first to admit I can't draw for anything. It is not my skill set. It never has been. Once a year, I take like a drawing course online and I try uh, to get better at it, but it's really not what I do best. What I do best when I storyboard is I really like a shot list, that like literal list I just talked about, and that overhead sketch. Hey, this is the main, this is basically what a Whole Foods or a grocery store looks like. This is how aisles work. And these are the angles that I want to shoot at. And I'm going to make them run through the entire scene at every angle multiple times to make sure that I have it anywhere. And then when I get into the edit, I'll know exactly how to cut it based on the aesthetic of these films, right? You and I have sent these five YouTube links back and forth, and we like them. Well, I know the cadence and the structure of how those are edited, and I know with these shots, I can do that. And if you don't like a shot for some reason, I have extras. I have room. And if we get lucky, I have this even cooler kind of one shot walking, evolving kind of close up ramp in, right? As long as the brand is comfortable with that, and as long as I've done my job communicating it, that's, a, that's typically all we ever use. There are other times when it really makes sense to say, you know what, my drawings are bad, but let me draw this for you. And then let's hop on a video call and I'll walk you through what, like, you think you're seeing and I know I drew and then accompany that with everything else. So to, to answer your question, why is storyboarding important? It's all about efficiencies. You're going to hire somebody for a day. You're going to hire somebody for two days. You want to make sure that as little time as possible in that location or on that shoot, if it's in a studio is spent wondering what else do we need? What else could we do? Because if you find a chunk of time, what you are hopefully wondering is, we have everything, what other cool stuff can we do here? We never get into a Whole Foods. Can I just get a cool picture of the founder walking towards their product because we have a little bit of time to spare and you know you can just give us that shot? Totally. I'd rather have that conversation than, do I have everything I need? I don't know. I think I have it, but I don't know that I have it. That's not the, that's not the right place to be on a film set. And so storyboarding is that pre-production work of making sure everyone is, is ready to go and has seen the script and has read it and understands whatever that storyboard takes. And that's what you're talking about, the planning. So that is another thing that I was really impressed with, the way that you laid that out about having those collaborative conversations, et cetera. What other things can you think about, Jeff, that we haven't talked about that you'd like to share and then how do we get a hold of you? Sure. Um, you know, for me, I think the, the kind of big final piece is 
you know, I would love to talk to anybody who has listened to this podcast and, and might, you know, want to just discuss video. Um, you, you said uh, a couple minutes ago, if you go to a surgeon, they're going to want to cut. If you go to a doctor that writes prescriptions, they're going to want to do that. And I think what's really, really cool about what we do at Sora and what I get to do every day is that I don't just want to take video. I don't just want to take photos. A lot of times I want to do what's right for the brand. And that means not doing either of those things. And so, you know, what I would kind of impart to anyone is if you know you want to do video, great. Reach out to me, find another video creator, and and now you have the tools to to get that started. If you think you might want to do video, feel free to reach out to me. If 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 any of this is something that you just want to talk more about, I'm more than open and willing to find the time to hop on the phone or grab a, a coffee or, or a drink at happy hour uh, and 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 have that discussion just to make you understand a little bit more about where video or photo or web might fit into your brand. That's not going to be a, a paid consulting hour. It's just a chat. Uh, I think storytelling is important and understanding it as a business owner and an entrepreneur is difficult. There's a lot of messaging out there about just putting out content no matter what and always having content regardless of the messaging. And I, I, I think that a lot of times we just sort of get lost in the noise. So if, if I can leave you with one thing, it's reach out. Find time, find someone you trust, whether it's me or, or a family friend who does this, and just ask to talk to them and, and see where it goes. If it doesn't lead to video, that's not a big deal. If it does lead to video, at least now you feel more comfortable with it. Um, and if you want to reach me, uh, my uh, email address is jeff, J-E-F-F, at Sora, S-O-R-A, dot digital. There's no dot com on that or anything else. I don't know if, if there are show notes you can put that in, but sure. my my email is always open. Um, it's it's right there. So please feel free to reach out with any questions you have, and and I'm I'm a resource. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'll definitely put a link to this in the podcast show notes and on the web page. Love that video that you shared about the backpack. Great illustration about how this should work. Yeah, a lot of great illustrations. But, you know, I keep thinking in the back of my mind how all that works. And so thank you for sharing that. Thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. And I look forward to our next conversation. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate your time as well. Thanks, Jeff. I want to thank Jeff for coming on today and for sharing his wisdom and his insights. What an important topic. The better that you can communicate with your audience, the more effective you're going to be in growing your community. This is something that I'm working on, and if you haven't checked out my new YouTube channel, you'll definitely want to. This is how I'm helping to raise the bar in my niche. This is how you can help raise the bar within your brand, within your community. I'll be certain to put a link to Sora Digital in the show notes and on the podcast webpage. Today's free downloadable guide is how to get on more store shelves. This talks about several of the key strategies that you can use to build a healthy foundation for your brand. You can get it instantly on the podcast webpage or in the show notes by going to brandsecretsandstrategies.com slash session 172. Thank you again for listening, and I look forward to seeing you in the next episode.